So when you think about these high-tech applications, so cryogenics effectively, what you want to keep cold, so space launch, uh, when you're using the fuel in a tank, you put helium in there to maintain pressure. For making semiconductors, uh, you need helium. Uh, for MRI scanners, for the magnet to superconduct, you need helium. Uh, cooling data centers now they're talking about as well. So all these new applications of requiring cryogenics, that's helium. We have a special treat for you because we cover all financial assets, commodities, but really, do we get to talk about helium? And today, joining me to do just that is the CEO of Pulsar Helium, Thomas Abraham James. Very happy to be here. So this is fascinating to have you and such a pleasure because rarely do we get someone from the helium space. How did you get into this field? It wasn't by design, I can tell you that much. Uh, so I guess you could say it was somewhat uh, fortuitous. Um, it all began about 12 years ago now, and uh, uh, my background, I'm a geologist, and so I had a, a wonderful job actually, exploration geology, and I was working for a, uh, a private uh, company at that time over in Africa, and my job was find something of economic value. So I had a uh, complete free reign to make a discovery, and uh, whilst uh, over there, then came across helium. And uh, it, was, it was tucked away, squirreled away in this book that I was reading and, uh, with a colleague of mine. And, uh, and then we found that Tanzania had this helium accumulation. So I went back to my employer and I said, well, mission accomplished. Uh, I found what you were looking for, uh, a potentially economic deposit of helium. Uh, at which point they started laughing at me Happy and said... Happy gas. Happy gas. And, that's, uh, <laughs> and that look, they weren't really looking to get into the clown industry and so on, but thanks very much. And that was the answer I was actually quite hoping for, because then I could go off on my own and start to uh, create my own helium company. And so then ultimately left uh, and ended up here with Pulsar. Now, Pulsar describes itself as a dedicated primary helium company. Mm -hmm. How does this set you apart from you know, rivals who treat helium as a byproduct? Yeah, this is really the key differentiator, so the word primary. So at the moment, the, the helium industry, for, for, for the end user, so we're talking about big companies here, NVIDIA, Panasonic, SpaceX, uh, the, the supply chain to them is, is quite, um, uh, I use the word ugly, to be honest, because it's a byproduct. Um, and so they then have these uh, long-term take or pay contracts. And so every week they get their delivery of helium, should they need it or not. And so it does uh, account for a lot of waste of helium, uh, inflexibility for pricing. And then if one of those natural gas plants goes down, then there's no helium. So for us, it's all about helium being the primary economic driver. And with that, being able to offer some flexibility to the customer. You want helium now, you don't want helium now to be able to be dynamic with supply for the first time. Now, for those watching as well, thinking this sounds really interesting, right? Uh, where else is helium used? Mm -hmm. uh, because most people just think helium balloons. Yes. Right? So take us through some of the industries, because this is such a fascinating topic. Space as well, and you know, a lot of technology relies on helium. Yes, it's, uh, I'd say, well, firstly, party balloons. That makes up about 4% of market share and is a frivolous waste of a very valuable commodity. So, but everything else is, is high tech. So the best way to think about helium is due to its uh, unique properties. So what you want to keep really cold without it becoming a solid. So uh, helium is a liquid at negative 269 degrees Celsius uh, that is completely inert, so non-flammable, it doesn't react, it doesn't rust, oxidize and so on. And that's helium. So when you think about these high-tech applications, so cryogenics effectively, what do you want to keep cold? So space launch, uh, when you're using the fuel in a tank, you put helium in there to maintain pressure. For making semiconductors, uh, you need helium. Uh, for MRI scanners, for the magnet to superconduct, you need helium. Uh, cooling data centers now they're talking about as well. So all these new applications of requiring cryogenics, that's helium. Um, you just announced a 10 well drilling program as well, mm -hmm. um, starting quite soon at Topaz. What sort of milestones um, should investors, uh, uh, if they take a position uh, in your company, watch for between now and first production? Pretty exciting time. So we've really ticked the boxes for, is the helium there at Topaz over in Minnesota? And yes, it is. And it's the, it appears to be the highest concentration in North America. It flows naturally to surface, not associated with water. So tick, tick. 
The next uh, thing we need to do is this 10 well program, and that is the, the determining the volume. What's the size of the prize? Uh, and once we have that bit of information, and really that drill program, it starts in a couple of weeks at the end of September. It will go through to Q1 next year. And then the culmination of that, so milestones, every few weeks there'll be a well completed. Uh, so that will be exciting. Uh, there'll be a, a resource update. Uh, and then we start to look at the economics for the first time. And uh, so with a feasibility study coming out, uh, we've got engineering works with chart industries who are looking to design the helium plant. So actually the, the news flow is going to be quite significant and, and dare I say it, quite good fun. Take us through the process in relation to traditional mining. We've got many viewers and many clients who are invested in gold miners, for example. Is it dissimilar? Is it similar? My background's actually hard rock, so uh, I came from a gold and platinum and diamond background, and here I am in helium. But uh, what I like about helium is actually the economics of it and also just the, the process. It's actually quite akin to um, precious metals, because with it, you never get a ton of pure gold, unfortunately. It would be nice. Mm. There's always some sort of uh, waste material there, and we talk about grade. And helium's the same. You never get a pure helium gas. Um, so it's always mixed with something else. And so for us, uh, you know, grade is king. And uh, so you could think of it that way. But in terms of the process, it's, it's actually a lot simpler than mining because you don't need to drill, you know, for some mines, you've got hundreds, if not a thousand uh, drill holes to determine the size of the resource. Whereas for helium, we're talking about a dozen or less uh, to determine the size. And then when it comes to extraction, it's very quick. Um, so the, the wells we've already drilled are set for production. They would then be put into a production facility that would be right there at the wellhead. And in terms of the overall capital costs, um, you know, should we look at one of the, let's say, you know, be, be, you know reach for the moon, the, the, the biggest helium plant in the world, you're still looking at a capital cost of uh, less than $100 million, which when you compare to hard rock mining is actually quite modest compared to the uh, usual capital costs you see. Now, I'm very curious about this mix that you talk about, Tom, because, um, you know, I, I, I'm very, very uh, fascinated by gold and gold miners. And there's a saying, right, that if you find copper, you're likely to find, find gold. Mm -hmm. um, what is the mix when you find helium? What, what's in it, in that mixture that comes out? And can you sell a byproduct? Yes, you can. Uh, so there's, there's typically three mixtures that you see. So one is the, the, the current model is helium with natural gas. Uh, the next one is you've got helium with nitrogen and nitrogen doesn't have any commercial value. Uh, and then you've got um, helium with carbon dioxide and that's where we are. So with CO2. And I must admit, to be honest, when I first saw that we had high helium, which is fantastic, but then there was high CO2, I thought, Jeep, jeepers, you know, what are we going to do with that? Uh, and the first thought was, well, we've re-injected into the ground. And actually in the US, you get paid for doing that. So it's quite a, uh, a neat little system there. But uh, Nice, a bit of payback. Exactly. So it's, it's the, probably, it's, it's funny when you think about it, you extract something and get paid to put it back in the ground immediately. Uh, it's quite an unusual business model. Um, but uh, actually in the United States, there's a big CO2 shortage. And where we are in Minnesota, it's, it's, uh, it's really exacerbated because it's quite displaced from the CO2 production. So for us, uh, we would be looking at a combined helium and CO2 um, for, the, for the economics. You mentioned Minnesota. Um, I believe you've got operations in Greenland. Is that right? Are you looking at any other places? We're very happy with our portfolio, to be honest. And uh, of course, I'm going to say this, but uh, I, I think we do have the, the best helium portfolio out there. And the reason I, I stand by that is that these are, are new discoveries purposely for primary helium occurrences. Uh, we don't go out with uh, you know, old known systems that have been exhausted for natural gas and now try and get the last bit of helium out of it. That's not our business. And so really, I think Minnesota and Greenland are the places to be. Um, you also have just raised some 3.7 uh, million uh, pounds across the UK and Canada. How are you gonna use these uh, funds and where are exactly are you going to target these funds um, in the near term? So this is really for the, for the drill program at Topaz, so for drilling up to 10 wells. Uh, so the majority of the funds will go to that. Uh, then we'll have the, the resource update and then look at the economic studies as well. So that's really where the money is being deployed. It's all going into the ground in uh, Minnesota. Um, we've also seen that University Banks um, not only boosted its equity stake to just under 5%, but also expressed an interest for, um, for, for more. Mm -hmm. How transformative is this financing package uh, towards production? 
I mean, it's such a, a wonderful vote of confidence, firstly, from a, a US banking institution to see the opportunity that uh, Pulsar represents. Um, so really, we're very pleased. And to, at the stage before, you know, we, we've announced final investment decision to ha know that one of the key uh, things, which is the money, uh, is, is indeed available for us, is, is a huge de-risking for us. So uh, look, we're, we're incredibly pleased with it. And uh, really, you know, should we get to that point where the, uh, we do transition towards uh, production, then we could do it a lot faster than if we didn't have University Bank there. So we're very grateful. Now, Tom, you're um, you know working really hard towards commercialization, right? Very soon, some 2027 um, uh, is is what I've seen. Um, you've also extended an existing uh, credit uh, facility. What does the funding pipeline look like before 2027? So, with the the money that we've raised recently, so 3.7 million pounds, that really gets us through for the next 12 months. Uh, so we budgeted for that. And then the intention is to go across and switch to a, a debt model as quickly as possible. Um, and one of the quite selfishly reasons for that is that I'm the third largest shareholder in the company. Uh, I would really like to, uh, you know, see if we can avoid any future dilutive events as well. So certainly very much looking out to the shareholders' best interests there. Nice. You've got skin in the game, as they say. Um, the move as well to um, acquire quantum hydrogen mm -hmm. effectively expands your... Uh, Minnesota land package uh, by a big number, actually, by around 1,000%. Mm. How does this uh, affect your growth profile? Really what it does is it consolidates our position in Minnesota. So we're the first mover there. We've made this wonderful discovery at Topaz, which is where our efforts are focused to realize its production potential. But at the same time, we have to capitalize on that first mover approach. And over the years that we've worked there, we've really come up with what is the Goldilocks zone for finding this helium. And uh, this, this ground that Quantum has, it really fits into that. And so what, the way that I see it is that this could provide future growth for the company. So we get Topaz online and then to get additional feed potentially from this area that we're uh, looking to acquire. Now we've got two questions uh, from clients. Thank you for sending those in. Uh, one of them being uh, momentum in land acquisitions and financing. Are we going to see more M&A uh, strategic partnerships in the coming months, Tom? Well, it's been quite thick and fast recently, I must admit. So uh, look, we I would say that we are always keep our eyes open for opportunity. When say opportunity, that is in the, in the area of interest in Minnesota. So we may well see additional activity there. And then also we're very excited because the state of Minnesota itself uh, is uh, soon to be leasing state land as well. And we've certainly expressed our interest in that too. One from uh, Paul, all the way from Spain, actually. Uh, with helium prices surging and supply chain fragility uh, made worse by global geopolitical tensions, he says, how is Pulsar Helium positioning itself to ensure stable, long-term supply contracts and mitigate the impact of market volatility for your end users, especially as major industries like chips and healthcare increasingly view helium, and rightly so, as a strategic resource. Well, buenos dias. Um, and look, I think that uh, it's quite a long question there, but I, look, I, I think that Really, it is very strategic. We're seeing that certainly with the, the technical applications, we a lot of talk about defense as well. Defense is ultimately a very large user of helium. Um, and really, the, the whole reason why Pulsar exists is, is to get to the answers to this question, which is guaranteed security of supply. And this has been the issue for the past two decades, is that you've got these big defense companies or big AI companies, and if they want to increase their product, then they will need guaranteed certainty with helium, which quite frankly doesn't exist. But compared to the overall costs, it's a tiny fraction, but it's imperative that they have it. And so for us, what I'd like to see is meaningful production from Topaz in Minnesota, not just a small little blip, but actually a meaningful uh, contribution to supply, but also to bring that stability. Uh, you know, it really doesn't exist at the moment. It's a very fragile supply chain, only a few sources. And uh, as a primary supplier, what we could also do is perhaps even create a spot market for helium, which doesn't exist. So to give that flexibility and then hopefully all those concerns are a thing of the past. And last but not least, I'm going to be devil's advocate. Helium is, of course, finite. Mm. So does not, that not mean that prices, you know, are going to be 
on an upward trajectory because this it's finite. But also, what is what is the the next leg for pulsar helium? Uh, because all commodities, as we know, Tom, um, it's a receding resource as opposed to growing resource. Yeah, look, uh, very much the case. And so helium is finite. And, uh, and what we see actually is there's, there's talk about companies going out and looking to, uh, to mine the moon for helium. So I'd like to think that there's still plenty of opportunity here on Earth. So it's not quite that dire yet. <laughs> uh, but uh, we've got uh, Minnesota, it seems to be quite a, a sizable occurrence. And we know that from the subsurface work that we've conducted. We also know that there's been some drilling as far away as 150 kilometers from where we are, and they're still getting multiple percent helium. So this looks like it could be quite large, which is great. So everyone could have, you know, hopefully breathe a sigh of relief that we're not running out and we don't have to go into, uh, into uh, a, well, a different planet just yet. <laughs> not just yet. Thank you so much for coming on, Tom. It's been such a pleasure. Um, for all of you wanting to ask um, the CEO of Pulsar Helium any questions, send them across to ask at ig.com, which comes to me, and I'll put it in front of him. Uh, that was the wonderful uh, Thomas Abraham James, CEO of Pulsar Helium.